In this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit about denial of service. Now, what is a denial of service? Well, basically anything that doesn't allow somebody to have legitimate access to what they're supposed to in this case. Let's pretend, for instance, you were using a network printer at your workplace, and you would like to print to this printer. If I came up and kicked the power cord out, you can't print to that printer because the printer's off. I, I kicked it out. I denied service. Okay. So the idea basically usually is in the form of either a protest or some sort of vengeance. There's really no benefit from a, um, I guess you could say, from a hacking perspective as far as usually when you hack into a system, it's to gain something such as to gain data or information that's on the system or compromised data or compromised credentials or something to that effect. With denial of service, that's ineffective. It doesn't, hap it doesn't happen that way because you're basically trying to destroy the target, not gain access to it because you've destroyed it. So the idea really is just a pure, pure in its base form is just plain and simple vengeance or destruction. That's all you're really looking at for denial of service. But we still have to look at it from the ethical standpoint, ethical hacking standpoint, and realize that people do this. Uh, in their protests, like when they deal with things like hacktivism and things like that. For instance, when the whole uh, WikiLeaks debacle came out there with the the, the Bradley Mann and, and all that jazz there about the uh, United States secrets and such, when that business came out, um, some of the, I believe it was the credit card companies, some of the companies were withdrawing their support for WikiLeaks because of you know what happened in that little incident there. So the collective, known as Anonymous, decided to go ahead and wreak vengeance on those people for, you know, having the audacity to pull their support from a website that they no longer agreed with how they were doing business. So they decided to go ahead and just deny service. So anybody that wanted to access, you know, these credit card web page based, you know, banking, whatever it may have been, they're basically going to say, well, we're going to take you down so that you cannot actually conduct business. So that's the idea behind it. It's just, like I said, plain and simple, pure destruction. And, uh, there's a few different ways you can look at how they do it. One of them is, a, one of them is what they call a layer four attack, and that would be the one similar to what the uh, uh, the collective anonymous had done with uh, with the credit card companies. Typically, the layer four is going to involve a lot of people and a lot of machines. Typically, you'll probably associate it with a botnet, which is a multitude of different machines together for one purpose of you know either distributed denial of service or password cracking or whatever it may be. Um, but that would be that would be the use of a layer four. You're using a particular tool, and you're making other people or having other people agree with your cause, and they also use the same tool to attack the same you know target. So like at the time they were using one called Low Orbit Ion Cannon. Uh, since then they've you know dumped that particular one because the FBI has constantly put that on the watch list. So that one's definitely one you want to be careful about downloading if you don't want to be on yet another watch list. Um, but <laughs> that one there was being used it's called low orbit, low orbit ion cannon. And basically if you can get this software distributed or people download it that agree with your cause, if I can get 50,000 people to agree with my cause and I say, Hey, at midnight central time on Tuesday, we're going to go ahead and aim our little LOIC orbit ion cannon deal towards this website. And we're going to go ahead and hit go and everybody's going to flood it with traffic and thus deny service. It's kind of the concept. Then you also have another one called Layer 7 Attack, or Slow Loris. And this one would be more like um, a tool called HTTP DOS, which would basically do incomplete gets, and one single person could actually do this particular attack and cause amounts, uh, large amounts of damage. And um, the HTTP DOS tool, or the Slow Loris one, would typically, like I said, attack incomplete or use incomplete gets to cause a uh, slowdown and a denial of service on a machine if enough of them were sent. Now, that didn't work on IIS servers, but there's a way to do it where you can send incomplete posts command that actually work on IIS as opposed to the get ones which work with the Apache. So in this case, that would be considered kind of a layer 7 or what they may term as slow loris. Then there's another type called link local. In my opinion, it's probably the worst one that I've seen out there, and we'll show you an example of this in a little bit. So let's start off with the layer 4 one, which is the... Uh, the uh, lower, uh, lower but ion cannon one. So I've got a an environment here. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. And I have a web server over here on Kali Linux. 
And whoops. And I started an Apache web server over here. And you can see here, here's the Apache server status. And all of these different dots are basically what I can process on this web server. So if somebody were to come over here, let's say, and bring up a web page, and they were to ask for the web page, like so, okay, that's me trying to connect to the web page. Now, notice there's nothing down here in this dot but that one W. So if I hit refresh, you'll see there's a read request. See the R right there? So you can see that that's just one person trying to gain access to the web server. Not a big deal because I still have all these other dots here, no problem. My goal as a bad guy is to fill up all these dots. When it fills up, nobody can actually get back in because, well, I've taken up all the room. So in this case, we'll use the same one they used there with a anonymous and such we're called low orbit ion cannon and this one here we'll put the ip address in of our victim 172.17.1967 and we'll lock on and this is what you would tell all the other people that are in your little botnet or whatever you know whatever your collective is that you want to smash people with you would tell them all to do the same thing enter in this particular ip address now i'm doing a local one here Obviously, you would use a remote address or a public address for that. And then from there, you decide what you're going to be attacking. In this case, we'll go ahead and attack HTTP. And uh, just for giggles here, so we don't completely smash the system, we'll do a 1,000. Okay? We're going to do 1,000 threads, attack HTTP. We've locked onto this address. So I'm going to go ahead and click on, I'm going to charge my laser. And then we'll come back over here. And I'm going to hit refresh. And you'll notice all of a sudden these, this traffic in here is starting to climb. Okay, I'm going to hit refresh again. There's more. Hit refresh again. And you can see constantly as I keep doing it and I keep hammering it, it's just going to continually smash it. And it's just going to basically eventually, and I've only kept it at 1,000 threads and I'm, only, I'm the only one doing it. But if you had like 15,000 people doing the same exact thing, you can see that that thing would be done uh, for quite some time. The only key trigger with this is that once it actually stops flooding, that it will go back to normal. So in other words, it's a continuous stream that has to happen. So that would mean that the person would have to be online the entire time doing this constantly. So that's why the DDoSs don't typically last like weeks at a time. Because that would mean you'd have to take your computer and stay at it for a week at a time. So you don't normally see that sort of thing there. But that's an example of one way that you can do that particular DDoS there. Now, another one, which is the slow loris attack in this case here, would be the incomplete post and incomplete gets. In our case, it will be incomplete gets because we're going against a um, Linux machine. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this tool up here. This is one of the more known ones, I guess you could say, to be able to do this. And you can see where it says slow headers. So they call it a slow loris attack in this case. Notice down here on the bottom that you can use post instead of get if you were attacking an IIS web server. Now notice the connections are only 400. The connection rate is 50. So basically when it reaches 400 connections, it's going to end. So I'm going to do that so that we don't completely smash everything I have here. But just to give you an idea. So first off, let's go ahead and give it an address. So in this case here, the address would be 10.0.0.100, which is our server over here. And let's verify first off that I have my Apache running. So Apache 2 start. Okay, there we go. So we're now running our Apache server. Let's go ahead and bring our web browser up. <clears throat> now we're going to go the same way here. We're going to go to the server dash status and uh, verify here. This is from our last example. <laughs> Let's see, local host. And then we'll say slash server dash status. Okay. So there again, we can see the status of the Apache server. And we see there's a bunch of dots that are empty, ready to go. So we'll come over here and we'll run our attack. And you can see it's starting to crank out a bunch of different uh, incomplete gets toward the other machine. 
So let's come over here and refresh our page. Now notice how long it's taken to refresh. <laughs> we are really putting the boots to this bad boy here. Still refreshing. So we may have actually already DDoSed it. <laughs> so that would be unfortunate. Then I would have to pause the video and restart everything. But uh, apparently we've hammered it enough where <laughs> you'll notice the X up here on the top. Right up here. Basically, it's still refreshing. Oh, there we go. So, yeah. <laughs> so this time we got instead of the instead of the closing connection ones, we got a bunch of read requests. So this will definitely smash the machine down. You can see that it took a lot longer to refresh the page on this one than with the previous tool. So, and this is only with one person. So that's a pretty amazing little tool to use right there for that as well. Let's go ahead and stop, make sure the attack is done here. All right, so it looks like our attack was done anyway. So our maximum number of concurrent connections, we'll close that out and quit that. So that's what they would call a layer seven slow loss attack. Now, the next one I'm gonna show you is quite interesting. I didn't realize this one until I was shown it, but this is pretty amazing. First off, ask yourself this question. In your NIC card properties on your own home machine, do you have this selected? Now, Microsoft recommends to keep it selected because there's a lot of different uh, technologies with Microsoft that use IPv6. So if you don't know if this is checked or not, then more than likely it is because it's the default. So when you have it there in Windows by default on your NIC card, it will have IPv6 checked because as of Vista and higher, they made the whole dual stack technology type of deal to make it both IP version 6 and IP version 4 compliant. So even though you don't run IPv6 probably at your home network, you're still capable of being an IPv6 client to receive IPv6 addressing. Okay, That's all that's basically saying. So more than likely, you know, you probably have this selected as well as a lot of companies in the uh, in the networking world because they use things like direct access for Microsoft, which needs IPv6, and a few other different technologies that mandate that you have IPv6. So it's a pretty common thing to have that marked there, okay? Now, what I've done here is I've addressed it with just an IPv4 static address, and the only IPv6 address I actually have is right here. Now, this address is what they call a link local. And if you're familiar with IP version 4, there is a version of something called a PIPA. And basically, if I have no DHCP server and I'm not statically assigning or manually assigning addresses, it gets automatically assigned a 169.254 class B uh, address range. That's called a PIPA. You can't get to the Internet with it, but it's only going to be used locally. Hence, it's called link local. In this case, this is what this is. FE80 is the equivalent from IPv6 of a PIPA in IP version 4. It will always start with FE80 and you know it's local only. So other than that one, which will be there if you have IPv6 checked in your NIC card, because it's basically gonna give it an address per interface. Other than that, you see that I absolutely have zero IP version 6 addresses here, okay? Now IP version 6 addresses work in a unique way. They're a little bit different, well, a lot different than um, IP version 4. They use this thing called a prefix, and I'm going to show you this picture real quick here. So in this case here, you'll see that there's a, a split down the middle where it has a slash 64, and then it says interface ID. Uh, IP version 6 address is 128 bits in, in size. So 64 and 64 is basically how they split it up. The first 64 is a prefix. The second 64 is the unique interface ID, the address, you know, the unique address given to the actual interface. And what happens is all your regional internet registries that are out in the world, those like Aaron and APNIC and LACNIC and all these other different ones out there, these ones are the ones doling out some IP addresses to internet service providers. So what they'll do is they'll have a slash number, and this represents how many bits you can't use, okay? So for example, if a registry were to give an ISP, a slash 23, they're basically saying the first 23 bits of the address, you, Mr. ISP, cannot use. That is only for identification of the registry. And then the ISP prefix, slash 32, could be in this case, um, 
uh, one that they give out to the different areas or different ISPs that are in the actual nation or wherever you're actually uh, having your regional internet registrar. And if a company decided they want to go ahead and buy a block of IPv6 addresses, an ISP could give them a slash 48. And what that means is it's saying, hey, Mr. Site, you can't use the first 48 bits of this address. That is my prefix and the registry prefix. And that basically gives the company 16 bits to subnet with um, before it gets to the interface ID. So the prefix is just basically something that can be you know, put on there by one of these entities. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, let's see here. So I'm going to come over here and navigate to, oops, actually, hold on. Let me increase the view here a bit. So I'm going to navigate over to CD slash USR slash bin. And from here, I'm going to use a tool called fake router. Now, in this case, um, let me spell it correctly first. There we go. In this case, when you have an IP version 6 address and network, you have routers that are capable of giving out these addresses. And you can either use DHCP, stateful, or you can use stateless, where it auto addresses the machine, something that IP version 4 couldn't do. And it's based off of the MAC address. So in this case here, if it was stateful, there's a, a couple flags in a router for IPv6. One's called the M flag or managed. And that's to give, you know, say that you actually, if I had a one in the managed flag, that means a DHCP is given the address in. And then there's an O flag called other options or options. And if there's a one in that particular flag, that means that it's also there to give use DHCP to give out options as well, making it stateful. In this case here, I'm going to fake that I'm a router because a router will basically just broadcast it out. Well, let me rephrase that because uh, they don't use broadcast in IPv6. So I'll say multicast because that's what they use. So they'll multicast this particular address and say, hey, I'm an IPv6 router. Do you want this address? So they'll have a prefix. And then if it's not using DHCP, a stateless auto-assigned address. So I'm going to use this fake router, which is a tool by the hacker choice, and it's built here into Kali. And then I'm going to give a prefix. I'm going to make one up. I'm going to say DEFC0 uh, colon colon slash 64. And if you're familiar with IPv6, two uh, double colons means that the rest of them are blocks of zeros. So that's why it looks like it's shortened to format here. Okay. So I'm going to hit enter. And then I'm going to control C. Let's go back over to Windows 7 for a second. I want you to take note here. As I mentioned before, I have no IPv6 address other than the link local. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to run IP config all again. I want you to see now that I've been assigned two addresses. See that? Out of nowhere basically, <laughs> coming from a fake router. So if somebody could fake having a router in your network, basically what's happening as you're looking at it is you can auto-address a machine. Scary, huh? A little freaky. And notice the prefix. Prefix is there, DEFC0. Okay? All right. Now, that's not even the scary part. That's not even the DDoS. I'm just pointing out how IPv6 works in this case. Now, let me show you this. This one will freak you out. Now, take note of the left-hand side window. Under CPU usage, it says 0%. See that? So 0%, nothing going on over there on the uh, Windows 7 machine. Okay? So I'm going to type another command in, flood underscore router. And by the way, let me preface this, preface this by saying that if you were to do this little demo from watching my video in a virtualized environment, which is what I'm doing, do not do this with host-only modes that connect you to the physical host, or don't do it with NAT or bridged. Only internal. Okay? Learn from my lessons, because <laughs> this will completely destroy your entire network if you do it incorrectly. So keep it as internal. Both of these machines are internal network adapters on VirtualBox, which means they're private. So I don't know what the equivalent is for that for VMware Workstation or whatever you're using, but make sure it's not able to communicate with the host, okay? Only the VMs themselves. That is imperative, okay? And also, if you're using Hyper-V, 
for your virtualization platform, this will not work. And the reason why this won't work is because they have a guard built into it called router advertisement guard. So it will absolutely not work if you're hosting your virtual machines on Hyper-V. Okay. So in this case, Flood Router 6, we're going to do ETH0, which is my Ethernet interface. Now check this out. I'm going to hit Enter, but then I'm going to hit Control-C as quick as I can. Okay, so I'm really only going to do the attack for a millisecond. You ready? Enter, Control-C. That's it. Now take a look on the left-hand side. Boom. See that? Look at my CPU usage over there on the left-hand side. Toast. <laughs> Toast. Now I'm going to run an IP config all again. And notice how it's not working. It's hanging there. Insanity. This thing here will smash networks left and right like you would not believe. It is, in my opinion, probably the worst DDoS I've ever seen because it only takes one person and it only takes a millisecond. Now imagine if I were to run it continuously. That would be horrendous. Now I did this as a demonstration once where I was uh, not wise to the fact of the host-only deal that I just mentioned. And <laughs> the entire uh, network that I was on just basically went down. And my computer was completely unresponsive. I had to shut down the machine, the physical host, for 20 minutes for it to actually recognize my NIC card. Because I tried bringing it up as soon as I shut it down, but it wouldn't recognize anything. So I shut it down. I kept it down for about 20 minutes before it would actually come back and respond. So basically, look at it, what is over there where it's the CPU usage. Now, you remember from our first two DDoS demos that the um, uh, attack, once you stop the attack, it went back to normal, right? Well, in this case, that is not the case, okay? I ran it for a millisecond. You can see clearly over here that I'm no longer running it, and it's still affecting the machine. Now, notice the IP, key, IP config all. It's just hanging there. It's taken forever to run IP config all. What's happened? I've destroyed my machine. I've, I've, I've totally wrecked it from it being responsive at all. And it would be horrendous if you were to think about this from the concept of a network now look at this. See all that? Those are all addresses that are assigned automatically to this machine. This is what's causing the DDoS. Look at all of them. It's still going. Still going. Still going. <laughs> still going. Still going. These are all addresses that are assigned to my machine. Look at that. Look at that insanity. There we go. Boom, boom, boom. Holy cow. <laughs> so that is insanity right there. That is a lot of addresses. <laughs> <laughs> too many to count for sure. But that's basically what's causing all this havoc. Um, but can you imagine, think about it like this. If you're in a network and you have 100 computers that are production network servers and they're running IPv6 on their net card, okay? You don't even have to have IPv6 version 6 in your network, okay? I don't have IPv6 version 6 here. All you have to have is the NIC card checked where it says IPv6, which, by the way, Microsoft recommends that you do not change that. They recommend you keep it checked for IPv6. <laughs> but now after seeing this demonstration, you may be thinking twice about that. But this is a distributed denial. Well, this I don't know if they would consider this a distributed denial of service attack because it's not, I'm not using multiple machines to do the attack. So this would be just a plain and simple DOS, denial of service. Crazy times. So I hope that opened your eyes to uh, some different techniques that you can use for distributed denial of service or regular denial of service attacks as well.